Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm going to, in, to start this session in a quite unconventional way. Uh, and I'm excited to introduce AJ Young, a producer, singer, songwriter, entertainer, and entrepreneur. He's the founder of Battery Tour, a renewable energy power concert series that raises money for portable solar power boxes for villages that do not have reliable access to electricity. He was named by the UN as one of the 17 young leaders for the SDGs and has begun developing Project 17, a music album based on the 17 SDGs. So, AJ? A-Y. A-Y? <laughs> My okay, A-Y, sorry, I'm sorry. A-Y, please. We play, we, we start by playing it with you. hip-hop artist makes an international name for himself. He is the first artist to power his concert with 100% renewable energy. It is a real honor to recognize Mr. A.Y. Young, the founder of Battery Tour. It's incredible. Can't wait for you to see this. The United Nations is now throwing its support behind him. Mr. Young has made a big impact in his young life, born in 1991. He's a singer-songwriter, a dancer, producer, entrepreneur, and sustainability advocate. He's staged and performed more than 800 concerts. He was named by the United Nations recently as one of 17 youth world leaders of the world. The only individual selected for that honor from the United States. change. I'm here to listen. Don't ask me questions. Tell me what to do. Give me ideas. My mission is to kind of break down these silos, these, these barriers, and build bridges to power collective action by bringing everyone together. It's going to be incredible. My work plans in three different phases. I'm going to make an album powered 100% by renewable energy. Right now, A.Y. Young is working on an album based on the 17 United Nations goals. Major stars like Tech 9 and Billie Eilish will collaborate. This will be the one I'm called Tech 9, and I am part owner of Strange Music. And right now, a part of Goal 1, baby. Oh, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> There are 700 million people that are still living in poverty. The whole premise of your music is about collaboration 100%. and about getting excited. It's about going across the finish line. I don't think anyone can disagree. Not everyone needs to have access to energy. Where are all these outlets for change? We... Oh, what's up, guys? We... Mike Chad. How you guys doing? Yeah. Having a good cop? I'm gonna, I'm, gonna try, I'm gonna try a song that I haven't really done much. Um, the Energy Anthem. Because we all need energy. I remember when, like, I, I, um, I was telling him this story. I, I had powered, like, I had done, like, 400 shows. And I was sleeping in my car with all these batteries. And I remember, like, in America, there are places that don't have energy. Like, or, like, the grid's bad. Or I was, like, trying to, like, get on my Netflix and I couldn't even get on because there's no internet. And I remember, like, searching and uh, finding out at the time that there was a billion people that didn't have energy. And I was like, oh, shoot. And so, you know, I had this whole concept how, like, everyone is an outlet for change, right? Like, everything, everyone is an outlet for change and plugged into each other, like, on the local level, on the community level, on the world level, like, cop here, like, we can 
power change, you know? So I'm like, okay, I'm an outlet. Music's a universal language. I can do, you know, I gotta build something. I can build something to get people plugged in. So I built that box, right? And I started using every concert to raise money to send one person, one village access energy. And so it's been a five-year journey of doing that. And I'm really happy to say we've actually brought energy to over 17 countries. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna try the, the energy anthem. I haven't really done this that much. Um, trying to get like Akon on here, Bono, potentially Chris Martin. So tell me what you guys think. Let's try it. This, down just a little bit. Hey, down baby, mic down my ear. I, I can see the light. I can feel the rain sunshine down and energize. I can feel the energy. Yeah. One billion without a light that sparks tonight. But you shine so bright. It don't seem right. Yeah. Like 10,000 leagues under the sea. The voices are just singing. We got the power. We got the power. We got the power to bring energy. Energy is storing up inside of me. Inside of me. Together we can power change. So plug it in. So we can light up. Light up the world. Energy. Energy. Uh, you're the enemy. The enemy. It's like a new identity. like a light up since you got the phones out the there's a billion uh well there's like 700 million people without power so let's do it for them hey i uh, i can see the light oh that's good this is like the arena part when everybody energized. like screams loud you know? hey, I, I can, can feel, feel the energy Goal seven. Mm, I can see the light. I love that. That was good, guys. Thank you. I'm AY. It was amazing. Thank you, AY. Amazing. Unmatchable level of energy, really, <laughs> from you. Thank you so much. Right. We're now starting uh, the session and uh, we will be talking about different kind of energy. We'll talk about energy networks and infrastructure networks, still very important. So my name is Savina Carluccio, I'm the Executive Director of the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure. And I'm delighted to co-host today with Build Change. We've got two colleagues here from Build Change, Monica Schroeder, Director of Global Advocacy, and Sarah Bush, Chief of Staff, Bill Change, and you will, uh, you will see them and you'll hear from them. Um, so let me just start by framing the session a little bit. Our infrastructure systems are increasingly more complex and interconnected. Today we're exploring examples of tools and methodologies for assessing interdependencies and tackling cascading risks. So we have four short presentations now about some interesting tools and methodologies. And we will then go into breakout sessions to discuss further applications, limitations, and then the gaps that exist and where to next. So without further ado, we will now play a short video from Abhilash Panda, Head of Infrastructure Resilience and the Risk in Investment at the UN Disaster Risk Reduction Office. And he will give an overview of the stress testing methodology for resilience. Before we play the video, 
I, should, I would also like to introduce uh, Igor Linkov, who is a senior scientific technical manager for the US Army Corps of Engineers and adjunct professor at Carnegie Mellon University. And he will be online contributing to the breakout session. So we can now play the video from Abilash. It's my pleasure uh, to present UNDRR in the session on tackling cascading risk losses and damages in heavily interconnected systems at the COP27 Resilience Hub. My name is Abhilash Panda, and I'm the Deputy Chief for Intergovernmental Interagency Cooperation and Partnerships Branch at the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. I also head the Infrastructure Resilience and De-Risking Investment Portfolio. UNDRR is one of the organizations under the wide umbrella of UN bodies and is the custodian of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction 2015-2030. Resilient infrastructure is a prerequisite for achieving not only the aims of the Sendai Framework in particular, its target D for substantial reducing disaster damages to critical infrastructure, but also goal nine of the Sustainable Development Goals. As you would know, today more people than ever are dependent on the services delivered by critical infrastructure systems, covering energy, transport, water, wastewater, waste, and digital communications. Our society is heavily dependent on the effective and efficient operation of critical infrastructure systems to deliver public services, enrich living standards, and stimulate economic growth. Evidence shows that existing infrastructure systems and the services they provide are increasingly affected by, uh, by the impacts of climate change, but also by natural and man-made hazards. Between 2000 and 2019, Disasters claim approximately 1.23 million lives, an average of 60,000 per annum, and affected a total of over 4 billion people, many on more than one occasion. Additionally, disasters led to approximately 2.5 trillion US dollars in economic losses worldwide. These numbers represent a sharp increase of the number of recorded disaster events by comparison with the previous 20. Financing for resilience, disaster risk reduction, and de-risking investment requires a common understanding across all stakeholders. That is why we have developed principles for resilient infrastructure, provide guidance and criteria for increasing awareness and building a common understanding around infrastructure resilience. To, to integrate resilience as a core value in planning and implementation of infrastructure project, projects and to assist the public and private sector in making risk and fund policy and investment decisions. The principles of resilient infrastructure have been developed in consultation with over 100 key stakeholders, includes regional, uh, regional um, intergovernmental organizations, expert groups, and stakeholders coming through various uh, uh, from various investment community. The principles of ad the principles on adaptively transforming, environmentally integrated, proactively protected, socially engaged shared responsibility and continuously learning have been developed to help de-risk investments and to guide decision makers in making risk informed decisions. Investment must also ensure net resilience gain, meaning that investments definitely should enhance the systemic resilience of infrastructure and not create any additional risk. Implementation of these principles have been approved by over 110 member states, uh, which will lead to regulatory and policy changes for enhancing resilience. We are also in the process of developing the principles as an ISO, uh, an international standard, which will lead to national adoption and improvements in regulation. A key action of the principle on continuously learning is to conduct stress testing of critical infrastructure. UNDR has been working on developing a resilient infrastructure stress test model, which helps governments and various other stakeholders, engineers, investors, to base policy decision and investments on factual and up-to-date information on the status of resilience of infrastructure. This infrastructure uh, stress testing is an agile mechanism that allows decision makers to engage infrastructure stakeholders, take into consideration the changing risk scenario, identify interdependency, provide an overview of risks and vulnerabilities, and test the level of resilience of infrastructure in multiple and complex scenarios. Stress testing critical infrastructure can support better informed decisions, both to evaluate pre-disaster investments to withstand recover from disruption and to transform as well as identify optimization of opportunities for pre and post crisis, crisis investments. Conducting the stress test will allow policymakers to consider how changes in policy may impact risk 
and resilience of critical infrastructure systems, and will showcase the major gaps in infrastructure um, systems which need to be prioritized. Over the next few, uh, 15 years or so, there will be approximately $90 trillion of investments made into infrastructure worldwide. That figure represents more than the entire current stock today. This is a tremendous opportunity. Since every decision we make uh, in both public or private sector has consequences by either reducing risk or increasing risk, the principles for resilient infrastructure and stress testing can help us make better informed decisions to ensure infrastructure resilience. We are now working with countries to implement the principles and conduct stress testing to ensure investment decisions are risk informed and resilience is embedded in the decision making process. I will end here and thank you again for uh, listening to me and all the very best for the discussion. Thank you. Great. Thanks for, for this contribution from the UNDRR Abelash Panda. So I'd like to go now online for uh, a speaker. Monica Cardarelli, Project Officer at the European Commission Joint Research, Research Center. She's going to be speaking about the Joint Research Center's tools for critical infrastructure resilience. Over to you, Monica. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Savina. Could you please put my slides on the screen? Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, thanks for your invitation for having me here. I'm Monica Cardarilli, Project Officer and Risk Engineer at the European Commission's Joint Research Center. And as Savina said in my slides, I will be presenting the tools developed by the GRC to enhance critical infrastructure resilience. Next slide, please. Just a quick overview, the GRC is the in-house science service of the European Commission working to support EU policies. The research sites located in several member states host specialist laboratories and unique research facilities. Next slide, please. The GRC, through its scientific service, bridges trade stakeholders in acquiring up-to-date knowledge through networking and information sharing initiatives. Among them, the issue of a periodic newsletters and particularly the establishment of the NRC framework almost 10 years ago aimed to foster new connection pathways and group capabilities. Next slide, please. In more details, HERCIP gathers a large community of experts working to support critical infrastructure resilience by developing recommendations and best practices for operators, public authorities, and decision makers. So HERCIP plays, plays uh, its role at the interface of policy, science, and network frameworks in a systemic manner, harmonizing and integrating multi-perspectives when planning and conducting its work. Next slide, please. The GRC also supports the better understanding of complex systems through simulation tools in the form of web applications. Among them, Poseidon is an interactive platform to support cross-sectoral exercises in both real and non-real time, while Rapidin is a decision support system for NAT. Attack risk analysis and mapping. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes. In particular, Poseidon supports the online organization, execution, monitoring, and assessment of operational exercises with the participation of multiple stakeholders. Next slide, please. When dealing with the risk of hazardous material release due to hazard impact, so-called NATEC, this tool supports damage estimation and assessment of cascading effects in a multi-hazard framework. Next slide, please. In order to enable more informed policy making, the GRC periodically develops reports and guidelines on foresight and strategic issues to better address emerging challenges affecting interconnecting systems in a forward-looking perspective, as well as to enhance their resilience in a more holistic manner by considering interdependencies and domino effects across domains. Next slide, please. For more details and information, here are our channels and contacts. Thanks for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. So we will have the chance to hear more from you on applications of these tools in the breakout. Thank you for that. So now I have um, 
another Monica, Monica Schroeder from Build Change. She's here with us today. And she's going to be presenting on the Resilience Housing Ecosystem Assessment Tool. Thank you, Monica. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for having me here, and thanks so much to ICSI for, you know, co-hosting this session with us. Um, I, you know, that was an electrifying start to uh, to the session. No pun intended. Um, and I, you know, when I when I think about housing, you know. We're considering this in the context of infrastructure. So I think it's important to consider first off, why are we talking about housing? Housing is infrastructure. And when we're talking about tackling cascading risks, it does imply what are we connecting them to? And for those of us who are lucky to have a home, at the end of the day, we're hoping to head back to our houses and have you know, not only access to electricity, but ha use the roads to get there. So. That's why we're talking about housing in the context of tackling cascading risks. So what we do at Build Change is that we are a systems change leader for resilient housing. By, you know, this week I just heard that we surpassed 8 billion people in our population. It's a huge number. And for us, we envision a world where every house is disaster resilient, every person has access to that kind of... Uh, benefit that kind of a luxury, um, although it shouldn't be a luxury, should it? So one thing that we have been working on to help assess how is resilient housing um, applied and you know, understood within this context is the Resilient Housing Ecosystem Assessment Tool. Now we published this last year in the context of the Build Change Guide to Resilient Housing, which I'm happy to share after this session if that is of interest to you. But what the Resilient Housing Ecosystem Assessment Tool does, or RHEAT for short, is that it helps countries, cities, states, even programs understand what, what is the, where are they in this resilient housing journey? And so what it is, it's a tool that is both, you know, an actual technological tool, something that you can see, something that you can fill out, but it's also a facilitated discussion to understand what is it that countries or actors are doing well in the resilient housing space, where are there maybe some gaps, and where can they go from here? So. It tracks change and progress over time. What it really seeks to do is to understand at that moment in time, give a snapshot of how is, how is resilient housing being addressed. And it supports, like I said, it identifies gaps in policy and program implementation, understanding a little bit, is it lacking a little more in the investment space? Is it lacking a little bit more in the policy and legal framework? What aspects of it are really going well and where can we push progress along? And it also strengthens long-term successful climate change adaptation measures. The only way that we're gonna make progress in this space is if we have a really transparent, honest understanding of where we are. So our heat assesses a number of different factors. Within the um, driving demand for resilient housing space, it looks at what does the policy look like? Who is driving the demand for resilient housing? Is that governments, homeowners, funders? How are we ensuring supply of resilient housing through technological solutions, through you know, improved engineering and technical expertise? And then how are we financing this? I know, you know at this COP we've talked a lot about the money side of things. How are we actually financing the implementation of these kinds of programs? So I'll keep it pretty short, and I'm happy to you know, discuss this more in the breakouts, but this is really meant to be used at multiple moments in time, both as a monitoring and evaluation tool and a diagnostic tool. It's meant to understand, you know, maybe you're launching a new program on housing resilience. Where do you start? How do you already know what's going on? Or maybe you've been implementing a program for a while and you need to understand, are we, are we taking this honest look at ourselves? And if not, how do we go from here? So that is the short of the R heat tool. Um, you know, by, by 2030, 40% of the world 
population will be living without adequate housing, which is a huge amount. And so as we're talking about infrastructure, I urge us to think about, you know, how does this relate to the houses that we live in, work in more increasingly with COVID and play in, learn in? How does that all connect? So thanks. So I'll, I'll just sit here for the next part of the session, but we do have another speaker now. Uh, thank you, Monica, for your presentation. Um, I'd like to in introduce Jasper Verscher, postdoctoral researcher from Oxford Programme for Sustainable Infrastructure Systems, OPSIS, from the University of Oxford. He's going to be presenting on the International Infrastructure Systems Models, NISMOD 2. Yes, thank you, Zafina, for introducing me. Um, I'm waiting for my slides to come up. Ah, there they are. Um, so thank you for having me on this panel. My name is Jasper Schuur. I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of Oxford and part of the Oxford Programme for Sustainable Infrastructure Systems, which is led by Professor Jim Hall. And today I will present um, a brief overview of the NISMOD tool, the National or International Infrastructure Systems Models, a tool for climate risk analysis of intercoupled infrastructure systems. Next slide. So NISMOD is not just a tool, it's actually a set of tools now for climate risk analysis of national infrastructure systems. And when I refer to infrastructure systems, what I actually mean is different infrastructure types that are all represented by nodes, edges, and flows within it, the infrastructure network. And also very important, the different infrastructure types being interconnected with one another, as can be seen on the figure here. The infrastructure system analysis that we do is both climate risk analysis to the infrastructure asset itself, but more importantly, the systemic risks of the infrastructure failure. This could be people affected, um, transport flow disrupted, or the economic value lost. And we have pioneered this tool in the UK, but now expanded this tool to many different places around the world. And I would like to give a brief overview of some of these tools now. Next slide. But before going there, a very brief overview. So the top layer of the tool or the first set is always the data layer. So we try to find the best available data on hazards, the infrastructure networks itself, surfaces, and also getting a view of the socioeconomic system. So how is the populations and the economy dependent on the infrastructure? Then on the sort of next part of the tool always includes sort of the failure analysis and the risk analysis. So it's intersecting the assets with the, the hazards, modeling the disruptions to the surfaces, and also trying to figure out what are the macroeconomic implications of infrastructure failure. And then we bring this together in risk analysis, which could be expressed as loss exceedance curves. And most importantly, at the end, what we want is try and evaluate adaptation options within the system. So this could be options to the assets itself, making them more climate proof, but also changing the system or the network as a whole. And we, the tool allows quantifying the benefits and costs of these adaptation options and also prioritize them in space. Next slide, please. So I'm giving you a few snapshots here. So this is a tool we developed for the um, uh, Planning Institute of Jamaica, um, consisting of different infrastructure types and at the top showing you a sort of screenshot of the direct damages to the road infrastructure as a result of extreme rainfall. And at the bottom, it's a visualization of the adaptation of the electricity substations to flooding while by making them more climate proof. And this is just a snapshot to show um, some, some things that we've implemented in the tool. Next slide. Uh, this is another tool we built for um, Southeast Asia and to show that we've also scaled this up now to uh, multiple countries. This is showing the um, electricity transmission network and the exposure to uh, cyclone wind in which we quantified not only the damages to the transmission lines, but also the economic activity dependent on these transmission lines and what are the consequences if these transmission lines are not working. Um, and this was developed for the, for the World Bank. Next slide. Another tool here we developed uh, more recently for Eastern Africa, um, a sort of deep dive in the, the regional transport system. 
And, and I'm showing this here to sort of show that we're not only looking at present day damages and losses, as, we, as can be seen on the, the left hand side, but also the future and seeing where are the risks increasing the most in the whole infrastructure system. And this could be used to prioritize adaptation options. Next slide. And just very briefly where we're going with this, we're trying to scale this up. And in fact, uh, last week during COP, we had some presentations where we showed the sort of first version of the, the, global, um, the global tool that we developed now. And we're also thinking of adding new features such as nature-based solutions as uh, adaptation options, better representing the business interruptions uh, in the tool, also looking at cross-border risk, and, and we're working on a version of this with the IMF now, to looking at cross-border risk of port failures. And also, very importantly, I'm trying to implement event data sets instead of hazard maps in the analysis. And I'm uh, happy to talk more about the sort of future directions uh, in the breakout sessions. Next slide. And that was it. And I just want to highlight that this is uh, the team effort. So I want to uh, not only um, well, give credit to the whole OPSIS team for working on the different tools over the last couple of years. Right. Thank you very much, Jasper. And thank you to all the presenters for their informative uh, presentations. So time to move to the discussion part of this session. We will have two breakout groups, one in the physical room and one in the virtual room. Uh, for during the breakouts, we want to explore applications. And we've got a slide showing what the breakouts need to be. So during, during the breakouts, we want to explore the applications of the, of the tools we heard about, and also understand what the limitations are and what the future direct direction should be for this type of tools. And we also want to identify any other tool that exists and have not been mentioned in the session. So I'd like to welcome the breakout facilitators. Um, so I'll probably say we just sit, sit on the chairs for this part. So I welcome Sarah Bush again, Chief of Staff from Build Change, and Monica Schroeder, we will be Director of Global Advocacy. We, we heard from her. And online, we've got George Karajanis, who is the Director for Engineering Leadership Group at Resilience First. He will be moderating the virtual breakout. So. For everyone online who wants to join the breakout, you, you will be sent a link. Please click on the link and you will be sent to the breakout room. And we will meet again here in 15 minutes to share the key, key findings from the discussion. Handing over it to you. Thanks so much, Savina. So we've heard about some great tools that are both going to help us in our decision making, but also support us as we go further faster. And so now it's time to turn it over to you and to really understand what types of tools are helping you in your own day to day work. So I would love to come around and share the microphone. And I will start off by asking about uh, can you provide more details and examples for how your tool can be applied in practice? Is there something that you're using regularly that's been helpful? And could you share your name and who you're with as well? Sure, hello. I'm Professor Preeti Parikh from University College London and also council member for IC. Um, this is more a question. So we've had an excellent series of presentations on tools, uh, kind of overlaying uh, resilience, overlaying kind of uh, infrastructure. But the big question here is adaptation implementation. This is supposed to be the core of implementation. So my question for everyone was, um, how will these toolkits lead to climate adaptation? So how the overlay between, for example, infrastructure, um, Hazard will lead to adaptation and hence will lead to climate finance. So I'm actually posing a question back. Great, we'll take it. Monica, would you like to take that one and share about how your tool aids in adaptation? Sure, I'm happy to. So um, yeah, in terms of how, how our heat as a tool, you know, 
advances in affects adaptation. You know, adaptation is at the core of housing resilience. When we're talking about housing resilience, we're thinking about the impacts of climate change. We're thinking about extreme heat. We're thinking about storms. And so what this aims to do is catalyze that action. You know, when it comes to adaptation outcomes,
I'll, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. So, just checking that we've got um, George online. Oh, okay. So, okay. All right. So we do, we're not ready to start. Okay, maybe we can start with the discussion that we had in the in the physical in the physical room, George. In the physical room, uh, so Sarah, uh, we we had a bit of a discussion about tools and approaches and limitations. Quite a lot of discussion on limitations and what the hope for where we take it next. Can you just summarize for us the key points? Yes, absolutely. So what I heard is that we need tools and planning that are going to lead to direct implementation and that we can no longer wait to put the planning and the preparation into place so that we can help families today who are on the front lines of the climate crisis. We also need to think about information infrastructure and how tools are available and to make sure that they're open source. We need to build capacity and have simple tools and also to know that these tools don't need to be incredibly complicated. The more accessible they are, the more people they can reach. And then uh, also I would say that um, there's a huge variety of tools that's already built and available and so getting them into the hands of the right people is also critically important so that we can work towards implementation today and now. Thank you, Sarah. I'll just uh, check in that George, he is online. Hello, George. Nice to see you. You're on mute. Yeah, maybe you, you can speak now, try. Yes, can you hear me? He, loud and clear. <laughs> you startled everyone in the room, but nice to see you. Nice to see you, George. Okay, is, um, is something going terribly wrong? No. I, 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 I do this sometimes, I scare people. All just right. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can I, can I just ask you to um, give us a, br a brief summary of the key points you discussed in the virtual breakout, please? Yes, thank you very much. Um, we looked into uh, use cases and uh, uh, the, the benefits and limitations of uh, various models. Uh, first of all, Igor Linkov uh, uh, began discussing the uh, stress testing approach that UNDRR has been uh, has been developing. The idea is, is, was to figure out how interconnected systems can address cascading failures and how to visualize interconnections. Um, the Mr. Linkov pointed out that uh, uh, the the idea of stress testing has been used in different fields uh, like uh, the, the nuclear industry, the finance industries for quite a long time, but originally dates back uh, to, to medicine. Uh, what the what the UNDR approach is doing differently is that it's moving from risk to resilience uh, stress testing uh, via tiered structure, which attempts to find connections uh, through uh, table tabletop exercises and different uh, uh, modeling. Uh, subsequently, uh, uh, Ms. Cardarelli from the uh, European Commission Joint Research uh, Center uh, pr uh, discussed how the various uh, tools that uh, the, the JRC is uh, uh, developing uh, are used in uh, to, to support European Union member states and above. Um, uh, the, uh, the, for example, uh, Poseidon is, an, uh, is a network-based tool which provides services such as uh, cost estimation. It uh, helps to optimize resource allocation. Uh, it covers large geographic areas and uh, cross sectors using uh, essentially what-if uh, scenarios. Uh, she did point out that one improvement they're working on is uh, they're trying to make it uh, more comprehensive. And uh, also, Ms. Scott really pointed, uh, uh, briefly described uh, another tool, uh, Rapid N, which looks into the impact of uh, natural hazards on various critical infrastructure. Um, uh, subsequently, uh, uh, Jasper uh, presented the um, a uh, tool developed at the University of Oxford uh, and how they used it for the government of Jamaica. The, uh, the added value of that tool was that it provided a holistic and collaborative approach, uh, which uh, uh, was, uh, among others, uh, used to assess the uh, existing vulnerability. 
the added advantage, the added value, for lack of a better expression, of, of the tool was that uh, it helped to prioritize investments and uh, uh, investments both uh, uh, stemming from uh, Jamaica's own budget uh, and uh, from from other finance uh, fund funding instruments. It also helped the, help them to uh, unlock uh, funding uh, for from. Um, uh, from uh, for, from different funding uh, organizations, uh, then uh, Mr. Westcomb from um, uh, PRI asked a, a question about the the, uh, the vulnerability assessments and how the the granularity of the of the data or the understanding of the risk uh, comes into play, and the uh, the the uh, Oxford model seeks to scale up analytics, but still applies them uh, at a national level. Uh, the um, the uh, uh, targeting adaptation is on an asset level, uh, seeking to understand specific specific vulnerabilities. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, Mr. Linkoff uh, uh, pointed out that the the critical factor here is to move from risk and vulnerability to resilience. Thinking about more, about thinking more about recovery and asset level of resilience, um, rather than simply hardening uh, assets to uh, to to bluntly resist the impact of uh, of natural hazards and more. Uh, this is uh, this was the uh, the, uh, the these were essentially the notes. Uh, uh, Katie Bomber and I kept from the uh, from the session. Uh, I hope. It, it answers the, uh, the the main questions from the break breakout session, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, to hearing uh, what the the physical room had to say. Well, we 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 did it the other way around, George. Sorry, we've kind of missed uh, the physical room um, remarks, but we our discussion was a little bit more on the limitations. We talked about data. Uh, that we need data, we need it to be integrating data and information across different agencies. We talked about different levels of tools, whether they are high level system mapping or something that is a bit more granular. So that's kind of what we discussed. But thank you so much for moderating the session and thank you for sharing those um, key points with us. Thank you. So. Just uh, last few points for me. Uh, this is a complex topic, and by no means is the end of the conversation. This is uh, an open, an open, and ongoing discussion. We hope you found it useful. Uh, please visit the resource page at the Resilience Hub. We have more information about the tools that have been presented today in the session. I'd like to thank all the speakers and the facilitators. Thank you, Monica and Sarah here in the room, and thank you to the colleagues online, Jasper, Monica, Igor, and George for facilitating. Um, yeah, so I'll just uh, drawing this session to a close. Thank you very much again, and uh, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you. <laughs>